Order. The sitting is resumed and it's time for questions to the Minister of Justice and we'll start with listed questions. I call Mr Mike Nesbitt. Mr Nesbitt. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, thank you very much. Question one. Principal Deputy Speaker, as I explained during the last oral question time, my department has not done an assessment of the cost implications because we do not have full worked out arrangements agreed by the five parties to know what it is possible to implement. It is fairly safe to say that there will be additional costs involved with establishing a body such as the HIU and the subsequent need for additional resources. It is also very clear that significant costs for dealing with the past are falling on the Department of Justice at present and are creating a very significant pressure on the institutions in the justice system dealing with the needs of the present day. That is why it is so vital that we deal with the past on economic grounds, as we also need to deal with the past on moral grounds. I'm going to call Mr. Nesbitt for supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank the Minister uh, for, his, for his answer. Uh, leaving aside the proposals uh, that came out of the, the failed Haas process, uh, does the Minister accept the status quo is not tenable? Uh, and if so, what pressures uh, and what, 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 what ideas does he have to deal with the pressures? I'm thinking particularly of coroner's courts, legacy coroner's courts, Article 2 compliance under the European Convention on, of Human Rights. What additional resources and timeline does he envisage uh, for putting this right? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I appreciate the member's questions. I'm not sure I could agree with the premise that the Haas process failed, given that some of us have been spending several hours a week uh, during this year in terms of trying to make the Haas process tie up together. Yeah, yeah. But what is absolutely clear is that if we do not have the Historical Investigations Unit, there will need to be significant work done by the Department of Justice, which is already underway in preparatory form to deal with issues around the fact that uh, coroner's inquests have been held to be not Article 2 compliant in a number of recent uh, JRs. So there are fundamental issues that the executive will have to address in a joined up way to deal with some of those points. And it is absolutely clear that any, anything we do in that area will require some very considerable in, uh, investment, whether it is done uh, under the Haas process or is something separate. Can I call Mr. Chris Little? Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Would the Minister agree that there would be significant uh, financial and human costs with not uh, addressing the issue of flags, parades and the past, and indeed that the British and Irish governments must take their responsibility in resourcing and le showing leadership in relation to addressing these issues? Well, yes, I'm grateful for, for that question. It is absolutely clear that there will be very significant human costs if we fail to find a system which works properly to deal with the past. We have seen problems occurring within the HET, within the Police Ombudsman's Office and with legacy inquests. A new way of joining up those processes, as was suggested uh, through the HIU as part of the Haas process, I believe would give us major opportunities to move forward. I also believe that it is incumbent that both governments, both the British government and the Irish government, recognise the role that they played in the past and the responsibilities they have to assist financially as we seek a comprehensive process to deal with those problems. Well, Mr. Jim Mallister. Has the Minister given any thought to the cost to innocent victims of their quest for justice arising from the foolish Haas proposal that as an alternative they could have a self-serving provo version of the truth as to why their relatives were murdered. And as Justice Minister, should he not be to the forefront of making the attainment of justice paramount, as was obtained recently by the Proctor family, even after 30 years? Well, again, I'm not sure I entirely recognise the description that Mr Alistair gives in his usual eloquent way for the outcome of the Haas process, because the way I read those discussions, and I was part of those discussions, what we were looking at was the opportunity to get justice where it was possible to get justice. But for those families that will not be able to get justice after many years, in some cases they will wish information. And if that is something which provides some measure of comfort to those who have been bereaved as part of the troubles, if they can get information where they can't get justice, then I will certainly not be depriving them of that opportunity. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Alistair Macdonald is not in his place, so I call Mr. Raymond McCartney. Yes, there was a question number three, please. 
Principal Deputy Speaker, the publication of the Youth Justice Review in 2011 provided me with the opportunity to refine and improve the way we dealt with children and young people who, come into, who came into contact with the criminal justice system in Northern Ireland. The importance I placed on seeing through these changes was reflected in the fact that we set a target for implementation in the programme for government. The first step I took was to ensure transparency and accountability of the process through the publication of an implementation plan in October of 2012, setting out how this work would be taken forward, with an undertaking to provide regular updates both to the Justice Committee and to other stakeholders. The most recent update was published on the 29th of January. It shows that the great majority of recommendations have been implemented, substantially implemented, or advanced as far as possible pending legislative changes. The progress we have seen has been significant, but the process of reform continues, not simply in order to meet our programme for government target, but because we want a youth justice system that is fit for purpose and delivers the best possible outcomes for children and young people, their families and the victims it deals with. The Chief Inspector of Criminal Justice, by rightly focusing on outcomes in his report, recognises that this is a process that takes time and I am committed to ensuring it succeeds. And I call Mr. McCartney for supplementary. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer. Is the Minister satisfied that the implementation plan is robust enough and could he outline perhaps the timescale for the legislative changes? Well, certainly, Principal Deputy Speaker, I believe the plans we have are robust enough. Mr McCartney and other members of the Justice Committee will have seen the detail of those plans coming through and will have seen that there has been good progress made. Uh, the reality is that a number of uh, issues are in, um, involved in the legislative programme the Department has and he is also well aware as Vice Chair of the Committee of the legislative burden which currently sits before the Committee. But I certainly believe that as we look towards things like statutory time limits in the Youth Court, we will see significant progress during the course of this Assembly mandate. Here, and I call Mr. Danny Kinahan. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. May I thank the Minister for his answer so far. But would the Minister um, outline in detail some of the steps that have been taken to initiate work on the 12% of the sub recommendations that the CGI reported as there being no progress to date, and maybe highlight those that will be more difficult to achieve? Well, I'm not sure I should thank Mr. Kinahan for a question which asked me to outline the difficulties as to oppose to outline the successes, because a part of it, as I said in the main answer, really relates to the issue where legislative change is required, and we simply cannot implement those particular aspects purely by administrative processes. But, for example, we have seen very significant work done in speeding up the youth court, which remains to be underpinned by legislation in the future, and that is to some extent where we have not seen change. Just the same as, for example, we have administratively removed all under 18s from Hyde Bank Wood Prison, but we have not yet legislated to make that fundamental. So that's an area where there's a lot of work still to be done to underpin the good work which is already in, pro in progress. I thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. Can you, Minister, give the House some examples of where the changes and the following of the review and the implementation of the review have made a real difference to young people? Well, I would like to suggest I've got a complete authoritative list, Principal Deputy Speaker, pleasant though it would be to go through. But we have seen a lot of different work done by a number of different agencies. Um, for example, things like rolling out police discretion has been an area which has seen greater opportunities to dispose of matters quickly. Um, there's the whole wider issue of the youth engagement clinics, which have led to part of the speeding up justice programme and learning the lessons, both good and bad, which came from Hull and when a group of people visited that. Of course, you know, part of this fits into the wider Delivering Social Change programme, which affects the whole of the executive. Um, we've seen good work by the PPS in terms of the way they improve their communications with children and young people. Uh, so all of those are issues where we've seen a number of different agencies stepping forward and making major change on their own behalf. Thank you. And I call Mr. Tom Elliott. Uh, question number four, Principal Deputy Speaker. It is a fundamental principle within the criminal justice system that those without the means to pay for legal representation shall be afforded it by the state. This ensures that the state complies with its obligations under the Human Rights Act. I can confirm that both defendants in this case were granted legal aid. 
Mr. Elliott for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, I appreciate the brevity of, of the Minister's response there, but could he go on to outline how much uh, legal aid was offered to those representing uh, the defendants? And also, is it appropriate uh, that they would get that in cases like this, that uh, representation of senior counsel would be available where effectively there is no full criminal trial? Well, I think the problem, Principal Deputy Speaker, is that nobody is entirely sure whether there will be a full criminal trial or a plea of guilt at the point when decisions are made about awarding uh, legal aid. Um, figures are made available where legal aid is incurred in criminal cases, and I can confirm that the amount uh, paid uh, to date in the Magistrates' Court was £5,400 approximately, with so far only £2,000 paid towards the Crown Court costs, and obviously that will significantly increase when the final bills come in. But it is one of those issues where, unless you know for certain how a case will be disposed of, it is not possible to say that legal aid is not required to that extent. Uh, and before calling for supplementaries, can I point out that uh, this question, from the original question from Mr. Elliott, makes a very specific reference to the, uh, the, de the death of a police officer, and supplementaries have to address it in that context only. Uh, people just indicated they still wish to be called. Okay, I call Mr. Sean Lynch. Kerr Sever Curry, question five. That Principal Deputy Speaker, with permission, I'll take questions five and six together. In advance of publishing any consultation relating to legal aid reform, including that on Crown Court fees, my department assesses the potential impacts of the proposals. The assessment in this case concluded that there was no evidence which would suggest that there would be any adverse impact on legal, aid, on legal firms. On the basis of the information currently available, there is no evidence that my proposed reforms to legal aid will result in job losses or redundancies. However, as part of the consultation process, I have invited stakeholders to submit their views on the proposals and where consultees might be aware of any additional data on the subject to submit any additional evidence regarding their impact. I acknowledge that these reforms may require practitioners to consider more efficient business models and to adapt for the future. However, the nature of legal aid reform is such that there is a long lead-in time for reductions to take effect, allowing firms to adjust their practices. I call Mr. Sean Lynch for supplementary. I've got the previous count call you and go and quick a session error, and I want to thank the Minister for his answer. Minister, during the consultation, I met with a number of solicitors, particularly the, uh, those who represent family law. And they are very, very concerned that the, these uh, most recent proposals will uh, affect the most vulnerable. As the Minister is aware, the Department has commissioned a report by the Queen's University into legal needs of children and young people. Should he not wait before implementing these cuts and wait on the findings? Well, I think the difficulty is, faced with the financial position we are in, with a significant expenditure on legal aid beyond budget, this year something in excess of £100 million against a budget of 75, it is simply not possible to wait for the outcome of all the evidence before it is necessary to make those financial changes. Uh, like Mr Lynch, I have met a, a group of family lawyers. I think there is certainly an issue there which has to be addressed, which perhaps was not taken the fullest possible account of in formulating these original proposals, and the evidence which they have put to uh, my officials and to me is being currently reconsidered. There clearly are significant issues which are dealt with in family law matters, uh, but the fundamental issue is that legal aid reform is necessary and that the costs continue to significantly exceed the budget despite the cuts which have been made over recent years. Thank you, Nicole, Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, can I thank the Minister for his answer, but uh, I uh, just wonder whether the Minister is living in the real world in terms of uh, suggesting that there would be no impact or little impact uh, on firms of solicitors. Uh, after uh, the cuts in 2011, which amounted to at least 30%, if not more, the department is now proposing cuts 
in the region of 30 to 40 percent. How can the minister seriously suggest, and I agree with him that there needs to be reductions in legal aid, but how can the minister seriously suggest that in fact there would be virtually no impact upon the profession? Well, um, the unfortunate issue I would address back to Mr McGuinness's legal colleagues is that few of them have been able to give us the detailed figures showing what the impact would be. But I do know, for example, um, that from a recent article in the Irish News uh, by a solicitor, something like, he estimated that something like 60% of solicitors receive less than £20,000 per annum from legal aid. So clearly, that is a relatively small proportion of what will be the income of the average practice. And there certainly are a small number of solicitors' firms which gain significant income from criminal defence work, but they're the people, frankly, who have the most opportunity to adjust their business models to ensure that they take into account the changes. But the simple reality is that even if you exclude the very high cost cases, we're still looking at the average cost of a Crown Court case in Northern Ireland being double the cost of a Crown Court case in England and Wales, and that is unsustainable. It is also the case that the Law Society has actually publicised in terms of seeking to encourage inward investment the fact that they believe that back office costs are significantly cheaper in Northern Ireland than elsewhere. They cannot on that basis justify having higher remuneration. I call Mr Roy Beggs. Principal Deputy Speaker, can the Minister advise why this review of our reduction in legal aid uh, is not part of a, a wider review of the justice system looking at delays and inefficiencies that occur at our courts? involving PPS and indeed uh, the police? Well, the answer is because looking at the cost of legal aid is a specific area where there are specific responsibilities, but it sits alongside the wider work of reform which is being done, which is seeing speeding up cases, seeing a reduction in the backlog of cases waiting in court, seeing better joining up between the police and the PPS and the court service and the judiciary with better case management all the way through. So those issues of efficiency are being addressed but that doesn't alter the fundamental fact that legal aid in Northern Ireland is significantly more expensive than elsewhere. I call Mr Fran McCann. Can I thank the Minister uh, for his answers uh, thus far. But would the Minister accept the need for an independent examination of the impact of proposed changes in the civil legal aid? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, it would be easy to have an independent examination if those who are making the case that there is an impact were prepared to give the Department of Justice the necessary figures on which to make such an assessment. So far, despite many requests, those figures have not been forthcoming. Ms. Rosalind McCarley. Can I ask the Minister, does he agree that the principles of innocent until proven guilty and the right to a fair trial are cornerstones of the justice system and that any more slashing of the legal aid budgets will ultimately reduce the time that defence lawyers can spend on cases and inevitably, inevitably lead to increases in miscarriages, miscarriages of justice? Principal Deputy Speaker, I think the answer is yes and no. The principle of innocence uh, until proven guilty is an absolute yes, but suggesting that what is being done to trim the cost of legal aid in Northern Ireland to a point where it will still be more expensive than comparable jurisdictions is not something which I recognise as fundamentally undermining that right. Thank you. And I call Ms. Bronwyn McGahan. Girl, may I get question seven? <laughs> The Home Secretary's Modern Slavery Bill sets out a number of legislative proposals which are intended to strengthen the response to slavery and, and human trafficking. The provisions in the bill currently only extend to England and Wales. However, officials in my department have worked with their counterparts in the Home Office on the content of that bill and have produced a consultation document for Northern Ireland which takes account of the Home Secretary's Bill. I am currently consulting on a range of proposals to strengthen our response to human trafficking and slavery. My proposals would simplify existing legislation in Northern Ireland, enhance the sentencing regime, introduce new civil orders, improve data capture, and extend the scope of the Anti-Slavery Commissioner proposed under the Modern Slavery Bill to Northern Ireland. Subject to consultation, my strong preference would be to bring forward any new proposals through Northern Ireland legislation where that is possible. Lord Morrow and I have discussed my proposals 
and agree that they broadly complement and reinforce measures in the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Further Provisions and Support for Victims Bill. We also agreed in principle that subject to the outcome of consultation and timing, there may be scope for certain provisions to be incorporated into his bill. There may also be a need for some subsequent amendments to his bill. Thank you. And Ms McGahan for supplementary. Good day. I thank the Minister for his response. Can the Minister give a timeline for, for, for the passage of both of the bills? I appreciate Ms McGahan's point. I think she might, she might be better placed to, uh, to look to her colleagues or other members of the Justice Committee to determine that. The reality is, if we are to ensure that Northern Ireland legislation ties in with what is being proposed by the Home Office, where legislation will only be making progress uh, through Westminster, we understand, shortly before the summer recess, it may be necessary that although the committee will have com potentially completed its work by shortly after Easter, that, the, uh, that we uh, defer consideration stage in this place to ensure that we get amendments which tie in. But that's the kind of point which I've discussed with Lord Morrow. I believe if we did that, we would actually see Northern Ireland legislation in place as fast as the other two jurisdictions in the UK. But clearly, it's a matter of ensuring that we get the best possible fight against human trafficking and slavery. And if it re requires a few weeks' delay to get that done properly, I believe that would be beneficial. Mr. Paul Given. Principal Deputy Speaker, can the Minister indicate to the House if he's now prepared or in a position to come on board with Lord Morrow, in particular around Clause 6, criminalising the purchasers uh, of those who uh, buy sexual services, that that can lead then within the United Kingdom so that that clause could be replicated in the modern slavery bill that's currently going through Westminster Parliament. And we can join the Nordic countries, the French socialists, those in the Doyle unanimously supporting this clause, led by Podrick McLaughlin, Sinn Féin's TD for Donegal, and we can make a powerful statement leading on behalf of the United Kingdom. It comes to something, Principal Deputy Speaker, when we get a Sinn Féin TD praised by the Chair of the Justice Committee. <laughs> but I suppose there's always a first. It, it will come as no surprise to the Chair of the Committee or to any other members of the House that I'm not in a position to agree to clause six of the bill. I think it's a matter of public record, but I will happily repeat it, that there has been a significant meeting of minds between Lord Morrow and myself around many other aspects of his bill, that we are looking together as to how we can join up the fight against human trafficking and slavery alongside what is being done elsewhere in these islands. But I'm afraid I'm yet to be persuaded of the merits of clause six as proposed. I call Ms. Sandra Overend. Yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, yeah, I'm going to move on. I call Kieran McCarthy. Mr. Deputy Speaker, thank you very much indeed. Um, in his answer to the original question, the Minister referred to potential changes to the sentencing regime. Could the Minister provide the Assembly with a bit more details of what is in his mind or what he is proposing? Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Deputy Speaker. I begin to wish you hadn't let him in, Deputy Speaker. Um, <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's good that there's a meeting of minds between me and some backbench DUP members anyway. Um, I think the key issue is to ensure that having, for example, um, in previous legislation made human trafficking offences tribal on indictment only uh, and recognised the seriousness of them, that they could no longer be tried in the magistrates' courts. You're looking at issues which go beyond the minimum requirements of the European mandate. We need to ensure that we look at how that best fits in, for example, in enhanced uh, sentencing for repeat offenders. I note that the Home Secretary is planning, in particular, to have mandatory life sentences for repeat offenders uh, on trafficking issues. I'm not sure that that fits well with the current arrangements in Northern Ireland uh, legislatively, but there are clearly issues where we need to ensure that we treat all these offences seriously, and that's an issue to be looked at as the consultation goes ahead, both in England and Wales and here. Thank you. And Ms May McLaughlin is not in her place. Um, before I call the next speaker, can I notify the members that question 10 has been withdrawn? I call Mr David McElveen. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number 9, please. Principal Deputy Speaker, I was pleased to attend the launch of the Farm Watch Scheme in Palomina, a joint initiative between Palomina Policing and Community Safety Partnership and the Police Service of Northern Ireland. 
As the scheme only launched on the 31st of January, it is too early to allow any meaningful assessment for it to be undertaken at this stage. I call Mr. McElveen for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I do thank the Minister for his answer, and I do appreciate the fact that we are quite new into this scheme. However, the Minister will be aware that these parasites who have been wreaking havoc on our farming community by stealing huge amounts of money's worth of farm equipment operate largely under the shroud of darkness. And therefore, to receive a text message in the middle of the night that, farm, that there may be thefts operating in their area and may not always be picked up by the farmers who have signed up for this scheme. I wonder, in light of that, will the Minister assure the House today and indeed ensure the farming community of Northern Ireland that if, if a farmer discharges a legally held firearm in an act of reasonable force, that they will be immune from prosecution? Well, Mr. McElveen has, of course, outlined what the legal situation is, although the circumstances which he outlined, I suspect, would not fit into uh, the precise position. The reality is the use of potentially legal, lethal force is justified where there is a serious concern that life is at risk. It is not justified to prevent the theft of machinery. The important issue is that we do use the mechanisms that we have, and I appreciate his point that people may not be reading their text messages at 2 o'clock in the morning, although some MLAs appear to be tweeting and sending text messages at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, but we will, you know, uh, we will have to see how those issues can be best joined up. What is absolutely clear is that we have seen FarmWatch in a number of areas in Northern Ireland having positive benefits, and we need to see that we learn the lessons and apply them from one to another. And call Mr. Sean Rogers. Deputy Speaker, I know ministers are, it's a bit early for a complete evaluation, but in England the Farm Watch scheme would, would, the results would show that farmers who are part of the scheme are less likely to be victims of crime than, than those that are not. But even from your initial observations of, of, of the Farm Watch scheme here, what are, have you any uh, plans to uh, develop it out across the north? Well, I appreciate Mr. Rogers' point. In fact, Mr. McElveen asked specifically about the Balamina scheme, which was only launched a few weeks ago. Um, certainly, um, I was at an event in Fintler run by OMA PCSP around Farmwatch uh, last year, and there certainly have been benefits seen from that. I think what we need to also look at is how the, uh, the Rural Crime Unit operates. Remember, that was only established at Balmoral Show last year, um, bringing together work being done uh, by my department, by the police, by NFU Mutual, in terms of looking at crime analysis and with a target to reduce rural crime by 3% in its first year. Given that we haven't even seen the first year yet, we have to look at that. But there is a, a good indication of strong work being done about amassing the data. We now need to ensure that we get the data showing a downward trend. Uh, and unfortunately, we see spikes at times because we are talking about a relatively rare crime and we see a geographical variation across Northern Ireland in which there's no doubt there are more problems, particularly around machinery thefts in police ENF districts than elsewhere. But those are the issues to learn the lessons and apply them from one district to another. Thank you. And I call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number 11, please. The process for appointing the Chief Constable of the Police Service of Northern Ireland falls to the Policing Board to establish and manage. I understand the Board members met to discuss the forthcoming process on the 6th of February and that they plan to approve the specification for the post, including any skills or experience required above the minimum criteria set, in, uh, set by the Ministry of Justice at their March Board meeting. Order. I'm sorry, the, uh, we're at the end of the period for listed questions. And we now move on to topical questions. And I call Ms. Bronwyn McGahan. Uh, almost 300 cattle have been stolen in my catchment area of Clougher Valley in a two year period and not one arrest um, as far as December 2013. And does the Minister acknowledge the very real concerns levels of crime are causing to the farming community? Well, I certainly accept the point Ms. McGahan made. That's the point which we just covered on the, on the previous question for Mr. McElveen. And I did highlight the fact that there are particular problems in police ENF districts, which includes her constituency. Uh, it is an issue where there's uh, ongoing work by the police, but where there is further work required around prevention and any work which can be assisted on matters like Farm Watch, the kind of work which is being done on fighting crime uh, and encouraging vigilance by PCSPs is to be welcomed. Well, Ms. McGowan for a supplementary. 
Gormiogad, I, I thank the Minister for his response, and I do welcome the, the PSNA initiatives to prevent crime in, in rural areas. However, as I stated, 300 cattle have been stolen and not one arrest. And has the Minister any concerns regarding PSNA effectiveness in dealing with rural crime? Well, I think the reality is we all know that crime cannot be dealt with solely by the police. It requires a joint-up approach to fight crime, to ensure that information is passed to the police, to ensure that people maintain their vigilance and keep their eyes open, and that they work through bodies like PCSPs to set up the appropriate mechanisms. Clearly, we would not wish to have seen any of that happen. Apart from anything else, there may well be animal welfare and animal health issues caused by such matters. Uh, but it is unfortunately the reality of where we are, and all we can do is ensure that the police are provided with all the assistance they can get from the wider community. Thank you. And I call Mr Cahill Boylan. Leave last can call you. Would the Minister now accept that he made an error of judgment in the way he handled the whole issue of the change of criteria for the appointment of the Chief Constable? No. I carried out my functions entirely in accordance with the legislation to leave the policing board to carry out its functions. I have nothing that I did wrong. I did it precisely as I should have done it. I call Mr Boylan for a supplementary. I call I pray last time called August go and break his as Dr. Agra. So thank you, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and the Minister for his answer. But then, will the Minister not accept then that it was a mistake that he didn't consult or talk to the policing board in the first instance, and he would now accept that it's a matter for the policing board to make this determination? Gormil Magad. Principal Deputy Speaker, I really would love to know how I didn't consult with the policing board when this matter has been discussed between the DOJ and the board since May of last year. Mr. John Dalit. <coughs> uh, Mr. Principal De Deputy Speaker, if I could perhaps move to a different subject, the Minister will, <laughs> will be aware. <laughs> the, the Minister will be aware that once again the VEX question of illiteracy and innumeracy has raised its head in our society. Nowhere are there more people who experience problems with literacy and numeracy than those in our prisons. Can the Minister shine a beacon of light into a corner of society that has failed up to 80 per cent of those people who are currently in the jails? Well, I'm very happy to discuss that serious issue because I think Mr. Dalit highlights a key issue about the reform of offenders. We all know that if somebody leaves prison with an education, with family contacts, with a house to go to, and the opportunity for a job or further engagement in education, they are much less likely to reoffend than if they leave without any of those. Um, I'm pleased to say that recently we have been able, following up on the prison review team's recommendation, uh, to recognise that the prison service itself is not best placed to run education, and we have temporary contracts or short-term contracts at the moment uh, in, in play from the beginning of the year, outsourcing <coughs> education and skills provision. Uh, it's something where clearly FE colleges have the ability to provide both education courses and to enhance issues around skills and look towards referral to, uh, to the opportunity for jobs uh, to grow from that. And I'm very pleased that we've been able to see that by good work between my department and the Department for Employment and Learning with a number of providers in place. And we will look to see how those contracts work as we seek to expand them for the future. Then call Mr. Dallas Mr. for a supplement. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I welcome that piece of good news to this Assembly Chamber. Uh, can the Minister assure us that the pioneering work in literacy and numeracy developed at McGilligan Prison will continue and that with the short-term contracts he has mentioned, he will ensure that the long-term strategy of giving hope to people who were failed by the education system in a previous life will in fact emerge from those prisons uh, capable of applying for jobs and, and getting them. Well, I suppose I shouldn't be surprised an MLA from that constituency will highlight the positive things about McGilligan Prison, but, in, but indeed it is true because there, were, there was an involvement from staff from North West College in McGilligan over a significant period of time. But what we have certainly seen is significant work being developed around the skills uh, and education generally agenda. Yesterday I had the pleasure 
of going to Magabri, uh, sorry, it wasn't McGillian, to see the Braille unit and work being done to provide uh, children's books in Braille for a project in Malawi in East Africa. A very positive example of giving prisoners something constructive to do in learning their new skills and also in providing something of real tangible benefit to some of the poorest children in the world. I certainly hope we will be seeing a further extension of that kind of work across all three establishments. Thank you. I call Mr. Chris Hazard. Can the Minister outline what steps his department have taken in the aftermath of the recent Pierce Jordan inquest to ensure that the coronial system is Article 2 compliant? Well, the answer to that is, is almost as was covered in the first question uh, from Mr. Nesbitt. There is significant work being done to look at the issues which are learned from the, uh, the Jordan decision and indeed other court decisions to ensure that we get our system functioning as best can be. I do believe that the best way that will be done will be through the historical inquiries unit proposed by the Haas report. But if it's not done, work is already underway within the Department of Justice to report to the Council of Ministers on how we seek to address some of those issues. And that work is involving my staff and also members of the judiciary under the leadership of the Lord Chief Justice. Mr. Hazard, for supplement. I want to thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, I understand evidence must be provided to the European Court of Human Rights before April. Uh, can the Minister outline what he is going to do in the next eight weeks to meet these legal obligations? Well, I appreciate Mr. Hazard's question, but I'd rather not spell out the detail at this stage. It's safe to say that informal uh, liaison is already underway between my staff and staff of the Council of Ministers to ensure that we can have a formal response which has to be presented to the Ministry of Justice in London uh, well within the timescale which is required. But it would certainly aid the work which is being done by my staff to know exactly where the five parties stand on the issue of the implementation of the Haas report. Okay, and I call Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. And, uh, could I highlight uh, the editorial in today's Irish News in which reference was made uh, to the fact that a loyalist protest group had failed to sign an 11 bar 1 form. Uh, the matter had been referred to the PSNI and the PSNI took no further action. Um, is the Minister uh, concerned by that decision? Uh, and if he is concerned, uh, what would he propose to do to remedy that problem? Well, I, I appreciate Mr McGuinness's question. Of course, as, as he's well aware, the specific issues of parading at the moment are not devolved matters, and therefore a legal remedy to that might be required from the Northern Ireland Office if we cannot agree on the devolution of parading matters to here. But certainly, um, I've, I'm not the least bit surprised that Mr McGuinness is concerned that if the form is not correctly filled in, that there is somehow not a problem. And clearly there are issues, and there are issues which have been discussed with the Northern Ireland Office about ensuring that the legislation is brought up to the mark in an ideal way, because this Assembly accepts responsibility for it. Mr McGuinness, for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his reply, <clears throat> and uh, it seems to me that he indicates uh, some concern in relation to the matter. Um, would the Minister propose to consult with the NIO or indeed the Secretary of State in relation to filling in the gap in the law which is uh, apparent from the decision by the PSNI uh, not uh, to proceed with any sort of criminal investigation? Well, to take Mr McGuinness's point, I would much prefer that this Assembly took responsibility for parading and got the legislation right in this place. But if this Assembly is not in a position to take responsibility for parading, I would certainly wish to discuss some of the practical outworkings of the difficulties of the legislation with the Northern Ireland Office to see what the Northern Ireland Office and the Secretary of State is prepared to do to deal with the issue. Thank you. And I call Mr Fran McCann. Well, it's uh, pre last count, Corla, and I thank the Minister for his answers up to now. But uh, can he give me an update on the work of the interagency project aimed at disengaged youth in the Lower Falls who may be engaged in car crime? I'm afraid I can't give Mr. McCann a, you know, a detailed report on it. I'm well aware of the fact that there have been a number of meetings since the incidents which were highlighted during the Christmas holidays. Uh, but it is largely 
at one level an operational issue for the police to deal with the crime as it happens and at the other end in terms of prevention it's the kind of work which is being done by the Youth Justice Agency and the PCSP and the West Belfast DPCSP to look at those kind of issues. If there are specific concerns he has, I'll, I'll happily try to address them. Thank you, Mr. McCann, for supplementary. Thank the Minister uh, for, for, for his answer uh, thus far. Uh, but he, he probably knows I, I was responsible for calling the multi agency meetings after Christmas, and it was because of a failure of the police uh, to be able to deal with uh, increased death driving in the that community. Uh, but there, there's a need for uh, wider agency meetings uh, to discuss the serious problems that exist within that area and to help people uh, get over the, the, the difficulties that uh, they face in that community. Well, I entirely agree with Mr McCann. He, you know, he knows, as every member knows, that I frequently talk about the issue of partnership. I mean, just the same way as, for example, the problems recently with the Odyssey were discussed by a multi-agency meeting convened by DHS SPS yesterday. If there are wider issues specifically affecting the lower falls, then I'm quite content that the DOJ will play its part in those wider agency meetings. Thank you. And I call Mr. Uh, can I ask the Minister if he agrees that the Criminal Legal Aid Bill uh, has been sufficiently reduced uh, and that further reductions uh, could result in a loss in access to justice uh, for those in society who are most in need? Well, the unfortunate reality, Principal Deputy Speaker, as I said earlier, is that we have not reduced the Legal Aid Bill, Criminal and Civil, together to get it within the, the appropriate budget. But I do believe that the changes which are proposed have still done nothing to remove issues from scope other than where there is a suitable alternative, and therefore I do not accept that we are reducing the opportunities for access to justice. Can I ask the Minister then further to that? Given the importance of preserving the integrity uh, of justice, does he not agree that the criminal legal aid budget does in fact represent good value for money? Uh, and if he does not agree with that, why does he not agree with that? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, it's a bit difficult when we have question time and then we have topical questions and we rehearse the same issues. But as I said earlier, when the cost of a Crown Court case in England or Wales is less than half the cost of a Crown Court case in Northern Ireland, at the same time as lawyers are talking about their cheaper back office costs in Northern Ireland, it's difficult to regard that as value for money. Can I ask the Minister if he appreciates and recognises the contribution made by volunteers in an organisation, Street Angels in OMA, which is making a good contribution to reducing antisocial behaviour and crime and uh, making our streets safer at weekends? Um. I, I fear, Principal Deputy Speaker, that Mr McElduff hasn't read either the Ulster Herald or the Trone Constitution this week yet, where he would have seen that I actually visited Street Angels in one of their training sessions last week and indeed met um, some, of, you know, uh, some of his political colleagues in the district. Um, so yes, I am well aware of the good work being done by that particular group in the wake of two tragedies which led to, you know, to the engagement in OMA around the nighttime economy. It's particularly uh, surprising at one level and not surprising at another to see that members of the two families involved are part of the Street Angels group, playing their part in helping to keep other people safe, even though they've suffered severe loss themselves. And I think we should recognise the contribution of volunteers in general, but those who've suffered and still contribute most particularly. Never ask a question that you don't know the answer to, but can I ask the Minister if his department uh, considers or does make a, a financial contribution to such voluntary efforts? Well, the answer, Deputy Speaker, is that by and large contributions towards such efforts would be funneled through PCSPs. Um, in some cases, and certainly in the case of Oma Street Angels, contributions made from the Assets Recovery Scheme, where we're able to put additional funding in uh, for small items of equipment or I am fairly sure that particular training course that I attended were funded from criminal assets, and it's always a pleasure to see assets taken off criminals being turned to good use. Order members, uh, that finishes uh, the, the questions to the Minister of Justice, and we must move 